I mean, you have elections, of course, for the national leadership. Yes. And the same metrics yes. would apply. But it needs to be in the consciousness of the voters. Uh, speaking about that elections, unfortunately, our political parties, two ruling parties, which is now in coalition, they each of them are promises before election cash, one 1,000, the other is 1,500 yeah. uh, in dollar terms. And they are competing with their promises. Yeah. As a result, they're sort of a buying, a voting. Yeah. This is a, another global phenomenon. And I'll tell you that it happens even in countries with higher incomes, like uh, Lebanon, or, uh, which is the only real Arab democracy, or nominal Arab yes. democracy. It happens even in the world's largest democracy in India. There's an emerging uh, body of work that studies Indian democracy, and it's called Elections as Auctions, right? Which is <laughs> vote buying. And in most <laughs> Indian villages, in most Indian areas, the election is an auction. Exactly what you described, promises of money yes. to get elected. If there is any way to stop that way, it's evolution. I mean, uh, one does not... You think it will still keep going? In India, of course. India is much poorer, right? Yeah. But it happens in wealthier countries like Lebanon. It happens in poorer countries like uh, India. India. In India, I see no way for it to change other than through the evolution. Uh, success and failure. Learning. Trial and error. But there are things that will happen. So, as roads are built, people will leave badly governed places, right? But there is an exodus out of some of the worst parts of India. People have just left. And then, when the government gets better, people come back. Bihar. Bihar is the most famous Indian basket case. Mm -hmm. The poorest, most badly run, most corrupt and dangerous part of India. Today, people talk about Bihar.com. <laughs> the government has changed. So right? the city has changed too? Efficient railways, better airport, So more better trade. infrastructure, yeah. better investment into uh, the way yeah. people live. Yeah. They're inviting in investment to build, uh, rebuild the great Buddhist university of Nalanda, which is outside of Patna, the okay. capital. So initiatives like this are putting it back on the map and waking people up. And that was the worst part of India. So it's possible. It's possible. Uh, for, uh, let's uh, talk a bit about the future of Mongolia. How do you see? Uh, we don't export anything other than mining, uh, well, I mean, copper, gold, mm. coal. Do you think a uh, Mongolian can produce something that we can export if there is a particular niche as you see, or I think it is hopeless? What do you think? No, it's, it's not hopeless. But there are two kinds of countries in the world, landlocked and not landlocked. Yes. And Mongolia is landlocked. Um, I've looked at landlocked places, you know, like uh, Nepal. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, Kurdistan, not yet a country, but basically becoming one. Yes. And they are, they face a special set of problems. Yes. Uh, but the solution is always to open, not to close. But that means, of course, then the rail infrastructure, the roads, the export direction to both neighbors, but also to the third neighbors. No, right? we, uh, uh, speaking about uh, railroad, we have recently, uh, the government made decisions to make every railroad in this country on a Russian standard, as it mm. is today. Mm. And they will continue to build uh, the Russian gauge, you know, with China, right. it's 85 millimeter difference. Uh, do you recall any analog where uh, the country, a sort of a melting point or meeting point of two different standards? Is it, uh, what is the best, to accept one standard of one neighbor or to a standard to accept both of them and get met in your territory? Well, the only good example of a switch is the European Union. Because as the Eastern European countries join the Union, when I used to travel from Germany east, the train would have to stop, the gauge would switch. It's very inefficient. Now it's all on the European system. European. So you have the French trains and the German trains. They can keep going nonstop through the whole EU. Harmonized to... Technically how they have solved because one is wider. Right. Huge in infrastructure investment. Investment. The EU so that both train can go on two sides, no? No, no, no. They replace wholesale. The European Union is the biggest spender in the world. When people say the Pentagon, you know, look at the American defense budget. I always say that the European Commission is the Pentagon of Europe. It <laughs> so spends, they have an investment. They have it a money spends for that. way more than the Pentagon does, uh, but for, the, for good things. It upgrades the infrastructure 
to the most widely used standard. What is happening now, and this is fascinating, this is why I talk about the new Silk Road, because eventually China has already brought together a consortia of about 30, 35 governments to discuss the harmonization of the standard so that trains can pass uh, without switching, unobstructed. Uh, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and Korea as well, and including Russia, Mongolia, Central Asian countries, the Stan countries, harmonize. There's a lot of money that needs to go into it. China is interested, Korea is interested, and so hopefully there can be a smoother passage. And Mongolia would sit in a very crucial point in that. It already does. No, I thought that exactly that's why, because that's why, because this advantages position, it's the only chance for Mongolia to have both railroads and to get connected in Mongolia, where the, whatever the switching things Has to happening switch. in this country. For, so it will be a long time before there is the perfect Probably harmony. down the road yeah. it will come. In the meantime, Mongolia is very well placed to be that junction point, right? And that's the way Mongolia should see itself, is that junction point.